All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today. We are very excited uh, for our swamp medicine talk today. Um, really quick, Seth is gonna go over the ground rules for the next 60 minutes on questions and etiquette in the Zoom. Just keep your cameras on and your microphones muted at all times. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat and we'll answer them or we'll keep them to the end. Sounds awesome. Um, and if you'd like, uh, we would love if you would edit your names and add any uh, uh, university affiliations in there, uh, just so we get to see that for fun. Um, so for anybody who's here for the first time, this project was started single-handedly last year by our fearless leader, Shilpi, uh, and has gotten really popular. And it's really awesome that you all are here. Uh, big congratulations to her. She just finished step one. Um, so, yay. Uh, really quick before we start, we do have an official Twitter and Instagram page uh, at go underscore WME. You can follow these for updates on when the lectures are or for any extra content that we have, like polls and extra posts. Um, again, to go over our mission. Uh, our mission is to create an educational platform where interested students and healthcare professionals can explore and interact with wilderness and emergency medicine. Uh, this project was created uh, as an international free platform to learn about all the cool ways to incorporate emergency and wilderness medicine into our future careers. Um, personally, I started coming to these talks last fall. Uh, and ever since I have been hooked and now I am part of the board and I'm very excited to be here and also share this with everybody. Um, we'd like this to be an international community as wilderness medicine often crosses a lot of borders. And uh, with that, we really value diversity and being culturally competent. If anybody has any suggestions on how we can improve on that, please let us know. Um, and yeah, we're happy that you're all here. Just as a lineup of past talks and previous talks, today we will be uh, going over swamp medicine, thanks to Dr. Rogers. Uh, you can also see all of our past talks here. The recordings will be on our website. And for future talks, we have aviation medicine and disaster medicine coming up and a lot more over the summer. Um, we would love if you guys would continue to attend these as uh, we have so many awesome people dedicate a lot of time to these presentations, and we are very grateful for this. Today, we have uh, Dr. Rogers. Dr. Rogers is a board certified pediatric emergency medicine physician. Um, after recording medical, after attending medical school at SUNY uh, Downstate College of Medicine, Dr. Rogers completed his residency in pediatrics at NYU and his fellowship uh, in pediatric emergency medicine at Namor Hospital uh, for Children. His passions within wilderness medicine include ultra endurance medicine, as well as studying the pediatric aspects of wilderness medicine. Dr. Rogers is an avid trail runner who enjoys spending his free time exploring the less traveled areas of South Florida. Today, he currently lives in Miami with his wife and three children and practices pediatric emergency medicine at Jackson Memorial Hospital and Holtz Children's Hospital. I will now turn it over to Dr. Rogers. Again, thanks everybody for coming. Okay, give me one second just to share my screen. Uh, thank you guys so much. My name is uh, Brent Rogers. I'm uh, as, uh, just introduced, I'm a pediatric emergency physician here in Miami, Florida at UM uh, Jackson Hospital, Holtz Children's Hospital. Um, I'd really like to thank you guys so much for coming. I know it's exam time for a lot of people at this time of year. There's also been just a full year in the pandemic and everyone's kind of getting some burnout. So I'm really glad you guys were able to come. And I hope you get something out of this. Uh, my medicine today, uh, my talk today is called Swamp Medicine, Experiences from the Florida Everglades, um, which uh, if you're like me, I'm from New York, originally. I moved down here seven years ago. It's kind of knew nothing about the Everglades before I came down here. But as someone who does love to run um, and just explore unique places, most people here in Florida head east toward the water to the various marine aspects we have. I tended to go a little west and you'll get a sense of everything and I hope you guys enjoy it. Um, thank you guys all so much for having me as well. It's been a real amazing series you guys have. Here. All right, you guys see the screen okay? All right. Uh, so when I was approached about doing a uh, wilderness medicine lecture, my first thought was to do a pediatric wilderness medicine lecture, something I've seen done before, something that's been done many times. 
Um, and I just couldn't really think of a good twist on what I would like to do to make it somewhat unique. Um, I am a pediatric emergency medicine. That's really where my passion lies in terms of medicine. And I do have three kids. So it's kind of where I would want to go. My next thought was maybe doing a endurance medicine, but one of your earliest med, uh, lectures was on that as well. I do enjoy doing trail runs and ultra marathons. And one of my other passions within wilderness medicine is following that up. But again, also been done before. Uh, what I've learned from doing a lot of trail running down here in Miami and in the areas just west of Miami is that there's not much literature or medicine at all on what's going on in the Everglades and you don't see too much about it. So it's also the spot I like to take my own kids to kind of explore. And this is where, as I grew up in New York and went upstate into the Adirondacks to do all my camping, this is where my kids are starting to go in camping and starting to explore. So I've learned a lot in this time period and that's kind of what focused me and wanted to share this with whoever is willing to listen. So I'm glad you guys are here. Um, similarly, I, when I sign up for runs down here in Florida, you get vague little messages such as, there are venomous snakes, feral pigs, bobcats, alligators, and more on the course. Know what to do if you encounter them with really nothing else. This is kind of how you learn about things down here and what I've been taught to do. So to just get started, we're gonna be doing a quick background of the where, what, and why of this area to kind of get you a sense of where we're going, then how to prepare specifically with going through hiking and paddling in the area, and then the specifics to look out for. This is what everyone who I asked to come on me with my little treks asking about the environmental factors and the various wildlife that you'll be experiencing. And that's kind of where everyone kind of wants to know what to do with them, what you're gonna see down here. So over the next couple of minutes, what you will not be getting for those uh, interested in mountain medicine is anything with elevation. This is the infamous Rock Reef Pass, the highest point in the Everglades, three feet above sea level, incredibly flat. You will not be getting mountain medicine. Uh, if you like the cold and Arctic medicine, the old timers still talk about the the time four years before I was born where it flurried for like five minutes in Miami, you will not be getting that. And uh, more realistically, you had a lecture, which I watched earlier on dive medicine. There is great diving to the east of Miami here, whether it's Biscayne National Park or John Pennycamp Park down in uh, Key Largo, but that is for another day. We are be going to the west of Miami when we're talking about it. So two big keywords in my talk in the title, Everglades and Swamp. So let me just kind of discuss what I mean by those two so you get a sense of where we're going before we go on. For those of you not from Florida, I know we're like the butt of every joke and I've been down here seven years, I still kind of see why, um, but this is the state I live in here. When we talk about Southern Florida, we're really talking about, for you guys who've been to Disney World, Orlando's here, Lake Okeechobee here, South Florida's down here. Now the historic Everglades, what was before uh, European settlement came here, was rain came in up above by Orlando, flowed into Lake Okeechobee, and then distributed all the way down throughout the whole south part of Florida, uh, excluding this area along the coast where most of the civilization is. There's a, a whopping 12 foot high rock ridge here, really the highest part in South Florida, 12 feet above sea level. Um, with development, as you can see, we've started habitating a lot of this area and the current Everglades, most of the water out of Lake Okeechobee now flows off to the sides. And what's left kind of trickles down. So this is the vague area we'll be talking about in this talk. Now, South Florida looks like a big spot on the map, but all the cities you know about, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, um, Mar-a-Lago, anywhere you've heard about in the news, all the way down through Miami to the Keys is really in this one little section onto the side. When we're talking about where we'll be exploring in the wilderness and where I like to hang out, we're going to be talking about this whole area, which is Everglades National Park. Uh, this area, which is the Big Cypress National Preserve or Big Cypress National Swamp, um, and this little area here called the Fakahatchee State Preserve. This area is pretty much minimally to not at all inhabited and just a full wilderness. That's where I'm going to be focusing. Uh, those areas I was talking about earlier, Biscay National Park, Key Largo, over to the side here. Um, and as you can see, just a brief picture, when you come into the park, there are tons of campgrounds all over for both exploring through hiking and through uh, paddling all the way up. So there's a lot of opportunity to come down here and get it. Uh, so we also said the Everglades being a swamp. What are the Everglades? Classically, most people think of it from what they see in the movies. And this is similar to before I moved here. Um, whether it be, a, you know, these old Tarzan movies or like the classic bayou type of dark swamps. This is what I think of when I think of swamps in the Everglades. So is it, am I kind of being facetious when I say it's a swamp? The fact that I'm asking that question means Kind of, yes, it's maybe a swamp, maybe not. Um, when people ask what are they, the natives called it Pahayoki, which is grassy water, um, a sea of apparently pathless grass, liquid land, um, 
the godmother of the Everglades, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, called it a river of grass. And pretty much anyone I ever asked to come out with me so, describes it as an unbearably human mosquito and alligator infested swamp. So most of you are probably thinking the same thing when you think of this area as a swamp in the classic term. Um, let's see, oh, sorry. Oh, there you go. Um, but a more apt way of saying it is what she described, that a river of grass. And when Marjorie Stoneman Douglas said, there are no other Everglades in the world, it's truly unique ecosystem that you can't find anywhere else on the planet. And that's what makes it very interesting. And when I call it one unique ecosystem, it's actually nine distinct interrelated ecosystems that travel between each other from cypress swamps, fresh mall prairies, uh, freshwater sloughs, coastal lowlands, mangroves, pylands, harbor hammocks, marine and estuary environments that all can be changed just by inches changes in elevation. As we said, we're three feet above sea level coming down. It's really something. And what you will see is just from Lake Okeechobee down to the water, mere inches, the water will travel over months going down. It doesn't, you can't even notice it moving, but it is a very slow moving river all the way down. Underneath is just a sl uh, thin layer of Miami limestone. So it kind of has a big aquifer where it stores a lot of the water below it. And as I said, subtle changes in elevation, market changes. The vast majority is this kind of sawgrass or moral prairie. This is that river of grass, water with grass growing out of it. Perfect for exploring with um, either if you're willing to get a little wet or in your kayaks. Intermixed with it, hardwood hammocks. That's where you're gonna find a lot of your wildlife and animals and the mammals you'd be looking for. This is where you're mostly doing your uh, kayaking down the mangrove forests. Um, and the rock pine lands, which are my favorite area, well, one of my favorite areas to be running. This is your more typical type of forest. So not really swamps in the traditional sense, but there are plenty of them, specifically in the lower part of the Everglades and in the big cypress area. And these are called cypress swamps where it'll be water. And if you're afraid of kind of getting water like this, like I was before I came down here, getting up to your knees and to your waist in water, it's going to be a difficult time enjoying things. But as you'll see, it's quite delightful. Um, this is just a brief overview, just showing all these systems kind of lay right next to each other, all based on subtle changes. You can have your pine lands above the water, your cypress swamps, which are in the water, growing out of the water, all the way down to your marine and estuary in the river. Um, the author Michael Grumwell described it once as a man of ordinary height and extraordinary grit could have walked the entire length of the Everglades without getting his hair wet, but his ankles might have been underwater the whole time. And depending on the time of year you're going, that is 100% true. Um, I've, I've explained where and um, what, I have, why kind of fits. Why do we care about the Everglades and why would anyone want to come here? Um, as I said, it's a subtropical wetland ecosystem. It gets 62 inches of rainfall per year, mostly in the wet season. During the wet season, it gets more rainfall than anywhere else in the continental US. Um, and it's a combination of drought and floods, fire and sunshine and rainstorms, depending how you're going. Um, why most people want to go is more for the flora, fauna, and what you can see down here. 60 endangered species, including 39 unique to Florida, uh, over 300 species of fish, uh, 360 species of birds, 40 species of mammals, and uh, 50 species of reptiles. You can see a whole bunch of stuff. That's why you'd want to be coming out here. Um, now, we're all wilderness medicine people. When most of us think of exploring the wilderness, we're not thinking of the typical. Uh, if you're here for a day trip, there's a lot of great ways to see things. Going to Shark Valley Visitor Center, you can rent a bike. There's a 50 mile path where you can see the alligators. I have a picture from when I took my dad down here for the first time later on. You can go to your typical Everglades shows or go on a ranger led tour. But for the purpose of this lecture, the way I explore this area is two ways. One is running or hiking, depending. Some areas you can't really run based on the amount of water you have. And the second would be paddling. Uh, so canoeing or kayaking, I'm a kayaker myself. So when I decide describing the wilderness of the Everglades and everything we're gonna be preparing, a lot of it will be applicable to these more kind of touristy ways of exploring. These are great, like I said, for a single day to get a sense of things, but if you really wanna see the area, when we're talking about hiking and paddling. Uh, so let me start by kind of talking about the hiking aspects. And there's a lot of different areas you could be hiking, different types of climates you'll be hiking and different types of environments you'll be going into. Um, when I talk about hiking, in the, within the Everglades National Park, there are a bunch of trails. You can find this area, which is in the rock pine land. You'll see 1.3 mile, 1.3 tons of trails you'll be able to find with campsites interspersed throughout. So if you want to go for a nice one to two day uh, hike out to um, a campsite, you can see rock pine lands. If you go down to the further south, you'll have it along the water. Um, the other area I like to explore is pretty much from right here, which is, this is about where West Palm Beach is. Um, this is the Florida Trail. It's a 1400 mile trail that goes all through Florida, similar to the Appalachian Trail in times of like its scope, but um, 
much, much different you'll see. And specifically this first part of it here, oh, sorry, is um, where I love to go. The first 30 miles, which is kind of like a no bail zone, you have to start, there's some camp zones in there, but once you go in, there's really no way to get out besides getting out the other end or coming out with a helicopter. Um, that's one of my favorite areas. And even in the driest season, we went in February and we did the 30 mile trek there over 20 miles of it had at least ankle deep water when you're going through this trail. So it's a hiking trail in the traditional sense, but not what you would think of when you're thinking of that place trails. A lot of water you'll be slogging through and you can only do so much running in that. Briefly, safety for the hikes when you're going out with your hikes. Number one, a map, get maps. I buy my maps just on the left side, whether it's from the Florida Trail, Everglades, they give you maps if you need to. Know where you're going, know how to use a camp, a compass and a GPS. Um, a lot of the maps, if you're not getting the formal ones, kind of have very vague symptoms. You want to know your latitude, latitude, and know your GPS, and also kind of let people know where you're going. Once you get a mile or two into some of these trails, you lose your uh, cell phone reception, and it's best to put it in um, airplane mode because you're losing your battery. So know how to use the GPS, know how to use your compass. It's a skill that you really would need to do. And always bring a flashlight because you'll never know when you're going to be out a little longer than you think or you're not getting to the camps that you were planning on before you get there. Um, you're going to hear me say this throughout the lecture, bring a friend. My hardest part with exploring this area, and often you'll see as you guys go on your career, doctors are often like the worst people at following their own advice. So I go out more alone than I should, letting my wife know where I am. But you want to bring a friend with you when you're going out there. You always want to have some help. Um, so trail conditions can vary day to day, week to week. You have a storm one day, and all of a sudden a whole area is flooded just from a single day. You can plan your trip for a whole week in advance, and then it rains and go. So always check in at the visitor center with the rangers and the websites um, of the various places where you'll be going before you go, because you may be thinking one thing and you have a totally different set of uh, terrain once you get out there. Um, I've mentioned already how flat the terrain is, just inches of change over miles and miles and miles. So some people are like, oh, I've done the Appalachian Trail. I go up mountains, I'm gonna fly through this. It's flooded, it's muddy. And they said on average, don't plan on walking more than two miles per hour. So if you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna set out and do that 30 mile, a stretch of the first part of the Florida Trail, don't be thinking you're going to pop that out in the next five hours or so. Be planning on that being a full day, if not taking a day to camp in between. Um, most of the places you'll be hiking are in freshwater areas, unless you're along the coast. Uh, bring plenty of water. I usually felt like a two liter um, jug in my back, and then I bring a filter water bottle, but there's plenty of Giardia here to be looking out for. So make sure you're bringing plenty of water when you're out there. Um, and a walking stick. Now, if you guys have hiked on some of the more uh, famous trails, the John Muir, the Pacific Coast Trail, um, the Appalachian Trail, you know the blazes you'll have. This is a picture I took one day on running through a Rockland Pineland. Um, and you'll see there's an orange blaze here and then maybe one all the way there. The problem is this is about ankle to knee deep muck with uh, little nettles and burrs. And this is where the coral snakes like to hang out. So you're constantly looking at the ground. And the problem is they're not, they're few and far between, especially if you start going this time of year in April through the end of October, no one's really making up the, keeping the trails up to date. Most of them keep it in the winter time. So it's very easy to get lost, no one to backpack. Um, another thing here in Florida, which I'm not as familiar with is hunting seasons. You always want to check out when and where hunting season is. You don't want to be fall prey to being um, hunted. And like I said, really, really consider bringing a buddy there was a story right as I started getting some friends to come out here a couple of years ago where two guys started on a through hike of the uh, Florida trail and got about 10 miles before they got lost, stranded, surrounded by alligators and water moccasins and had to be helicoptered out of there. So, you know, if you don't plan properly, this is going to be your fate. Um, in terms of hiking, make sure for day hikes, if you're coming down for a day, that's fine. Shorts, hat, t-shirt, nice and easy. But when you're down here, it's hot and there are bugs. You're gonna to wanna to have long pants and long sleeves. I hate doing that. I'm someone who gets really sweaty very quickly. So you have to find, I like wearing my long pants and sleeves when I'm running, nylon that can dry quickly and always have a mosquito net with you, especially for the head. Travel light in your clothes and supplies. I'll show you, I'll show you in a second what I carry with me. Um, when I first went down here on my trail, I got myself a nice pair of Gore-Tex shoes, Salomon. I'm like, oh, these are gonna be great. Keep all the water out. Um, sometimes what you have to forget is that, yeah, that's good if you're running through puddles, but the second you're going through waist deep water. The Gore-Tex does a great job of keeping the water out, but it also keeps it in once they're drenched. So you have to kind of think, just go with what's comfortable, what you don't mind being wet with, and always have your first aid kit, food, and your poncho. Um, this is just the typical trail. If you're lucky through the Pine Rocklands, nice, easy, you can have it. A lot more, you're gonna have small 
trail crossings like this. But as I said, you really have to be ready for water. Here's a video I took of me and my buddy going through um, where you were literally just flashing through. And this goes on for a long period. This is no better on either side. It's just high grass where animals are hiding. I always say, keep yourself not side by side, keep yourself separate just in case there's any sort of wild animal, which we'll be discussing in a little bit. And I always tend to go second because hopefully they'll scare away the alligators before you get there. Oh, how do I go on to the next one? Okay, um, know your first aid. Everyone's a little different with what you need. If you're going on a day trip, this is your typical first aid kit of everything I would need. The things to really bring insect repellent, whistle, um, going with it. I, when I go running out there, if I'm going for a day, I usually go for a day at a time, if not a single overnight. But if I'm going for a day run, which can be up to me for six, seven, eight hours, um, I pack my front with food. I pack a two liter um, uh, bladder with me and a water bottle. I always bring extra bandanas with me that can be used for a number of uh, no, number of uh, uses. Manual compass, GPS, my whistle. Everyone's a little different. I bring my Motrin, I bring my Zofran because I work in the PZR and I get hit by gastro at the most random times. You never know when someone's gonna get it. So this is my anti-nausea medicine. I always bring Motrin because I'm always getting hurt. Uh, my sunblock, my EpiPen, if you're an allergy guy like me, you don't want to be out there where you're going to be hit really hard all of a sudden with an allergic reaction. I bring always my EpiPen, and it's always good to use, and you know you can get three doses out of it. If you've ever been to like the um, Wilderness Life Support course, you know that you can get multiple doses out of it. Um, as I said, these are some of my injuries I got. Uh, one of the things you can see when you're running on the trail is they have these cypress knees, they call them. They're cypress, especially when you're in swamps that come out of the ground. They're big roots that you can easily trip on. And this is me running one day and just cracked my toe right into it and broke my toe. Uh, this is one day when I was about six miles from the nearest trailhead and I sprained my ankle. That's what it looked like when I came back. So again, you're really out in the middle of nowhere here. And it's not like where you have people coming all that frequently when you're out there. So make sure you have your motion, make sure you have your first aid kit when you're going out and know what you're gonna be getting into. In terms of paddling, which is another very popular way of going through it, there are little trails all throughout for single day hikes, but the, uh, the golden goose, what I have not yet done, I've only started going down here, is the 99 mile wilderness waterway, um, which is a lot of what I'm based on, is me prepping for this trip. Once I can find someone, or once my kids are older, my oldest is seven, to come with me for seven to 10 days, there's a 99 mile trail that goes through the Everglades, through the 10,000 islands. Um, this is one of the pictures I took on a random day. People are always worried about the alligators coming and you'll hear these stories every once in a while of aggression. Most of the time, they'll kind of come, they'll see you and they'll immediately just turn away and let you go. So a lot of the wildlife doesn't want anything to do with you, especially when you're getting these more remote um, places. Again, you wanna have your whistle um, or an air horn with three blasts, the international distress signal. Once you start getting really far out there, you wanna have a marine radio uh, set to channel 16 in the Everglades that'll kind of tell you what's going on with storms and stuff. Um, I do not have a marine radio or a satellite phone, but I will need one before my longest trip down. Uh, small weather radio, GPS to know where you are. Again, it's easy. Always bring extra rope. Throughout the Everglades, we have these chickies where you can rent for the night. So you can swim out, whether it's in the bay, the Whitewater um, Bay, which is one of the parts within the Everglades or the Florida Bay below the Florida, um, where you can rent this for the night. Bring extra rope, tie an anchor to it in case you capsize. Know your tide charts, your maps, and always check with the ranger station before disembarking in case you see if any storms or anything coming in. Make sure you have your personal flotation device. That's a pretty, uh, I still wear one that has a, like a full conventional because I'm extra safe, but the inflatable ones are good and can be used as well. I really stress avoid heavy clothes. Sometimes you're saying, I'm gonna be out in the sun, let me get my jeans and my hiking boots. They get wet and they never dry. And if you should capsize, they can really weigh you down with everything. In terms of what you're wearing, you wanna wear light, quick drying clothing. I tend to wear pajama pants, lightweight cotton. I don't get to wear them ever down here because it's always like 90 degrees in Miami, but this is where I wear them out. They get wet, they dry quickly. If you're feeling hot, you can cool off with them. Uh, it's very important to wear water shoes. There are a lot of oysters, surprisingly amount in, in the Everglades that you don't wanna cut your foot on. Um, and it may seem counterintuitive, but the first thing that'll always burn, you always forget about is your hands. So wear some gloves when you're out there. Okay. So you're preparing to go out now into the Everglades. I've given you a sense of what we're expecting, where we are, what it looks like. Um, now, what you should expect. When I hear friends, first thing I always hear when I'm asking people to come out with me is like, I don't want to get eaten by an alligator, I don't get bit by a snake. That's always the first two things people are telling me. And that's important to know. Um, it doesn't happen all that often, but it is important to know about. Uh, much more important is the environment that we'll be going to. So that's the first thing I'm going to touch in and how, what we're going to be expecting when we're going there. 
Florida, unlike anywhere else that I've been to, has such a varying discrepancy, and you see it more in the Everglades and Everglades, between the rainy season and the dry season. You may think a lot of times when you're going on hikes or vacations, when I grew up going to the Adirondacks in New York, it was always the summer. In the winter, it's covered in snow. You can't really hike as much. Here's kind of the opposite. The dry season is from November to March. It's a couple months it's where it's really comfortable, nice. The rainy season, which is when most people are traditionally going on vacation, April to October, it can be almost unbearable for a lot of reasons. The rainy season is nice. You can find a lot of orchids. If you're into flora, which I've become since I've down here, gotten a lot of gardening, you'll see the epiphytes, the bromeliads. It's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. And if you're into paddling, you have high water levels. So that's why you may want to go in the rainy season, but absolutely the only reason you would want to go. The temperature is above 90, the humidity is over 90, the heat index is crazy. Mosquitoes are like nothing I've ever explained. I'll, I'll get into them in a second, but you've never seen anything like Florida mosquitoes in the Everglades in the summertime. Also, not only do we have tropical storms that come out of nowhere, thunderstorms come in out of nowhere very quickly, roll in with high winds. Um, and also when you're there, you're not gonna see many animals when it's so flooded, the mammals and the exciting stuff. Most people will say, if you're looking for a good winter vacation, come down here in the dry season. Um, that picture I showed of me and my son, that was from February when most of the country was in ice and cold. We were sitting here in shorts and a t-shirt. Low humidity, clear skies, the mosquitoes are awesome. You see birds come when they all leave the north, they're coming down south town here. This is where they're living, this is where they're coming. Um, the water starts receding and leaves little holes and you'll see much more like you see the mammals kind of congregating. Um, it's also important if you're going to be doing some overnights and a couple day backpacking hikes. It does get cold at night sometimes, down to the low 50s, sometimes to the 40s and 30s, random. So again, it's always important to know preparing for those cold fronts. Um, with regards to specific environmental, the one thing I never understood until I moved here, I moved here in June. I'd only visited in the winter and sometimes when they say it's not the heat, it's the humidity, it's the most true thing you've ever seen. You can go for a run at night and you just can't breathe with the humidity. It's like suffocating when you come down here. I lived in New York where it gets humid and things like that. It's not like a dry heat like you would get in Arizona or something, but it's truly like nothing. Um, when I was preparing this talk, I just have to tell you from, uh, for the NBA fans out there, tonight, April 28th is the 34th anniversary that the Heat were awarded a basketball team down here in Miami. So historic day for basketball. Um, the Heat is on. That's what I should be titling my titles of this, but since I'm a Nets fan, I'm going to call it Beat the Heat. Um, really down here, it gets so hot so quickly and it's so humid, you don't even know what's going on. If you are out paddling, you kind of have this catch 22 of if you're on the Florida Bay, which is like I said, below Florida or the Whitewater Bay, which was which is within the, um, the Everglades itself. It's you want to be away from the mangrove trees because that's where the mosquitoes congregate. So you want to be out in the open where you have a nice breeze. You have no idea how quickly time goes when you're out there and you're just baking in that sun. So you really have to be watching every two hours you should dip into the shade, take a little breath, reapply your sunscreen and your lip balm. Make sure you have a hat on, your polarized sunglasses. And like I said, those lightweight long pants and long sleeve shirts. Doesn't matter if it's the summertime, doesn't matter how hot. Even when it's the winter and it's 80 degrees, that's hot out there, 80 degrees to be baking in the sun. You really need to do it. You really need to recognize the signs of heat related illness. We see this a lot down in my emergency room with the kids who are outside. It's amazing. My son's playing uh, roller hockey now and he was in a league and they're out there on Sunday, Saturday, it was 89 degrees, something like that. And they're out there for two hours running around. Kids really are, can get overheated very quickly. But the same is for you when you're out doing strenuous activity, whether it's running, hiking for hours. When I keep talking about this humidity down here, when it is so humid and there's so much like water in the air, your sweat does not evaporate as quickly and your body can't release heat as quickly. So the strenuous activities are really going to get you. I know so far, and by the time this talks over, any of you guys who are planning like a bachelor or bachelor party are now thinking, I'm going to do that 99 mile waterway tour with all my buddies. We're going to go out there. We're going to go drink. We're going to bring our young cousins or grandpa. We're all going to go out there and this is going to be an epic bachelor or bachelorette party. Um, all those things I mentioned, which sound like fun, will lead to you just getting really sick very quickly. Dehydration, drinking too much, being old or young, these are the things that are really set you up for a failure down there. So know your environment. Even like I said, if you're coming down and it's typically 75 degrees in the winter, we have Sundays in February, it's 85 degrees. And if you're coming down, be prepared for that. And when you're coming. Um, again, heat exhaustion versus heat stroke. If you guys aren't as familiar with the signs, if you start feeling dizzy and you're sweating a lot, you're getting that clammy skin, that's time for you to pull over, take a break, maybe set up camp for the night, drink plenty. Even if you didn't get to the chicky you had planned on, maybe find some dry land and pull up. If you're past that point where you have a headache, you're no longer sweating, you've got a rapid, strong pulse, you're vomiting, that's where you might be starting to consider calling in the Coast Guard to come helicopter you out of the area. Um, 
So make sure you're hydrating. Drink well before you're thirsty with plenty of electrolytes. Drink at least every 15 minutes. Most of us will bring big jugs of water, but also have your small water bottle that you can drink for the two hour period. So I usually bring my like gallon water bottles in the jugs that I keep in a hard case and then fill up my handheld water bottle, which I usually keep attached to my personal flotation device. And every 15 minutes, make sure you're taking a sip. Once you've done that for two hours, take your break, refill your water bottles. Um, when you are on the 99 mile waterway tour, uh, waterway trail, the wilderness waterway trail, there is no fresh water for the entire time. That's seven to 10 days. You will not have access to fresh water. It's very brackish. You might be able to get away with cooking with it if you're boiling it, but you can't even filter. So you better bring enough food, which they say is one to one and a half gallons of water per day per person with you on this trip. I tend to say, kind of of the leave no trace mentality, bring lots of things where you can eat and it just decreases your weight, especially when I'm running. So I bring a lot of nuts and oranges and fruits that as I run for hours, it's hydrating me and it's also kind of disappearing. So I don't have garbage with me and it makes my life easier as I go on with my run. Um, oh, I just kind of mentioned this. There is no water um, and you should easily have it. Uh, the reason I mentioned, um, I tend to bring the gallon jugs. Uh, these guys are at every campsite in the Everglades. I don't know how they get where they get. These raccoons will go into everything. They'll rip open your tent. They will get into your bags and they will rip open the plastic jug. So if you're going to use the plastic jugs, make sure you're wrapping it in something hard at night when you're camping. Um, if not, get a couple of these. I have a number of these because I do a uh, home beer brewing as well. And so that's what I tend to use. So you bring it, you can bring five gallons in that. And at the same time, when you're out on the water, it kind of the extra weight can serve as like a good ballast for you as you're kind of serving yourself to keep your balance out there. So you keep a couple of these and they're a lot easier to get to fill up your water bottle from it. Um, oh, I guess I'm fast. Um, in terms of environment, if you have not been out in like the open water of Florida with the lightning storms, these clouds appear out of nowhere. They come in very, very quickly. You wanna know the weather reports because it may be beautiful when you take out in the morning, especially if you're going five days in advance. Um, it's more important to carry a weather radio with you if you're gonna be going out. It's just to see where you're, out of nowhere, these lightning storms come in very quickly, heavy thunderstorms, high winds. They really come quickly. Learn to notice the clouds and when they're coming and give yourself a chance to get to safety. The classic adage of lightning travels one mile every five seconds kind of holds up. Um, in the Everglades, you can hear thunder for about 10 miles and lightning can strike 10 miles from where the rain's falling. So, you know, you kind of can be out of luck if you start seeing the lightning, hearing the thunder. Um, it used to be, a uh, 50 10 rule that if you can count for 50 seconds, then you should stay 10 minutes off the water. The more conservative rule they're saying now is if you can count to 30 between the lightning and the thunderbolts, that means you're within six miles, you should take a 30 minute break till your last thunder to get out to be safe side if you're going to be going. If you are out there during a, oh, here's some just basic statistics. People worry about the hurricanes and everything. This is over 35 years from uh, Florida in general. It's not just South Florida, but in Florida. Weather related deaths in Florida, 53% are due to lightning. So that um, overdose drowning, hurricanes, tornadoes, everything else combined. Um, and it's compared to other states, Florida over a 35 year period, it's about 10 per year, 345 deaths and 1500 over double anywhere else in terms of deaths and injuries from weather uh, lightning related injuries. So it's a legit concern when you're out there. If you are out on water specifically, whether you're running or if you are, um, hiking or on the open water. If you start seeing a lightning storm comes in out of nowhere, seek low vegetation, vegetation, avoid contact as best you can with the earth and get off the open water. So this is the time you're gonna to wanna to tuck into the mangroves and avoid any high trees, stay with the low vegetation. If you can get to land, whether you're running, you kind of want to take the pose here where you keep your feet together, lift them up almost like a baseball catcher as you're coming, tuck your head down, cover your ears and open your mouth to try to avoid the pressure. That's like the lightning crouch. That's if you're in the real close. I have had this not even just in the Everglades. When I'm in Miami, sometimes I'll be three miles from my house and out of nowhere, a lightning storm will come. And you'll see me doing this in the, on the side of a golf course, wherever I can find some low lying trees. And this happens very quickly. It's not just in the Everglades. It happens, it happens all throughout South Florida when these storms come in so quickly. Um, when you're with your group, and like I said, you took your buddies out, you're having your bachelor party. Um, if lightning comes and you guys are at camp or you're there, spread out. Clusters not only tend to attract lightning, but if lightning were to strike, you want to limit the damage and who's going to be affected. Um, and so you should have a plan for the camp. If something comes in at night, where are you guys going to do? How are you going to play? Um, we are all, whether pre-med or med or planning to be there. So most of us should be CPR trained, but don't take that as you're the 
gold standard. If you have a bunch of friends, make sure at least one other person is CPR trained because um, if you're the one who gets struck by lightning, you want to make sure someone else is there to help you out. It's also important, FEMA will say uh, throughout their website when they discuss lightning, that lightning strikes carry no electrical charge and should be tended to immediately. So you shouldn't be thinking out loud, oh, what if I'm going to get electrocuted? Once someone's struck, that's it. They're not like carrying electric activity like in Back to the Future or something with, like um, lightning bolts coming out of them. So you can start CPR immediately and that's what's best for patients. So um, make sure at least a couple of you guys are CPR trained if you're going out into the area and so far. Um, now, I guess I put this as an environmental because this is the number one environmental aspect for me. And these are the swamp angels, the mosquitoes. I, when I first came down here and I went running in June in the Everglades, I had never seen anything like it. these things are the size of like spiders. They're humongous and they just swarm you. It's like nothing you've ever seen. And that's during the daytime when you camp at night, it's like clouds of it. They are the craziest things I've ever seen. I can't properly describe how ridiculous it is. A couple old sayings about mosquitoes. Um, to talk to one another in summer, we need to throw a rock through the mosquitoes and yell through the hole. That's what some of the early flamingo, the lowest part of the Everglades, uh, settlers said to tourists who would come visit. Another old saying is if you fall from a tree in the Everglades, either the mosquitoes or the humidity will break your fall. And that's how thick they both are. It's really, I know you're probably like, oh, I have bad mosquitoes where I'm from. I've never seen anything like this. It is truly crazy. In the summertime, at nighttime, if you're camping in certain parts of the Everglades, it is like nothing you've ever seen. It is swarms, swarms, like just you can hear it. It's, it's crazy. Um, the mosquitoes are worst in the wet months. So that's anywhere from April through October. Um, and you can manage it in the winter and early spring, depending on where you're going. Uh, they love to live in the mangroves where you'll be paddling and on the small islands within them, but they're really anywhere you're anywhere near water, you're going to find them. Um, overnight is the absolute worst, but they are present all throughout the day. And what do they love? CO2, lactic acid, warm skin, moisture. That's me running and sweating. So they just come to your face when you're running or just hiking or sweating in any way. For the most part, they just are incredibly itchy and annoying and cause some minor allergic reactions. Uh, but the mosquitoes in the Everglades have been shown to cold dengue, West Nile, uh, Eastern equine encephalitis, St. Louis encephalitis, Venezuelan equine encephalitis. So it can be a threat to you. Uh, this is just showing, this is where West Nile virus appears in Florida. If you're kind of looking, this is right where we are hanging out down here. And if you're looking at uh, dengue virus, locally acquired cases, again, exactly where we're going. So this, if you're going to get dengue or West Nile virus in um, Florida, you're going to get it in the Everglades. There's also a unique uh, virus that's seen here. It's an alpha virus from the Venezuelan equine encephalitis family called Everglades virus, which is becoming um, an issue that has been seen specifically in the wet months. And it's been in all different parts of Everglades National Park. Uh, the rats that live in the Everglades are the primary hosts where 77 to 100% of the meals from the mosquitoes come. Uh, but they do love humans as well. Um, so this is more of a concern if you get bit. Typically, it's a couple days till you'll start seeing symptoms. But if you're on one of these seven to 10 day hiking or, um, or paddling towards, you start having fevers, headache, lymphadenitis, malaise, myalgia, you're going to want to kind of head out and get checked out. Um, so avoid camping near steering water. You should, at the very least, if you're not going to look like this guy and have the full mask, at least have a head mask for when you're out there. Um, and if you're going to be planning on leaving your tent, at nighttime in certain areas of Everglades, you should have some sort of suit like this. Um, I, to be honest, just avoid leaving my tent at night and just have a mask in case I need to. Uh, but at the very least, you want to have long pants, socks that cover everything and like nylon clothes that are tight fitting. Um, and you should have at least a face mask. Uh, if you cannot stand getting bit at least a little bit and you need to use the bathroom a lot at night, do not go overnight in the summer to the Everglades. Um, you should be getting permethrin, which is what we use in the PZR all the time to treat lice and scabies. So something that we use very frequently, but you should treat all of your clothes, bedding and netting, not your skin with that. Um, DEET is really the only thing that works that I've sent. There is some literature now saying lemon eucalyptus oil is almost as effective. And I'm going to guinea pig my kids with this since you really want to keep DEET less than 10% in kids, but it doesn't really work at less than 10% in kids. I use this for Pelmax. I get it at the local Publix grocery market. It's 40%. It's been shown after 30, 35%, the effect kind of wanes. You don't really have as much benefit to it. But I put the 40% on because I'm going for long, epically long runs when I'm out there and it lasts a little longer. Um, there's this like almost an old wives tale that this Avon product, skin so soft or citronella work. The first time I went running, when I first moved down here in June, I went out and explored a 10 mile run. I wore my loose litting fits. I did stuff and my wife didn't have any deep related because my son was only an infant at the time. So we only had natural stuff. I put skin so soft. And I came home, the picture doesn't quite do justice. 
This is wearing clothes. Every square inch of my body, legs, arms, space, neck was covered in mosquito bites. It was, and that was wearing loose fitting clothes with a mask on, with wearing citronella and everything. It just doesn't affect me. I'm talking a lot of smack about the mosquitoes, but they do, only the females bite, only 13 species do, and they do have an important part of the ecosystem. Um, the larvae are eaten, the larvae are eaten by small fish, which get eaten by large fish, and they're also a prey for a lot of insects. So it's a really important role. Um, so they are needed. They're, you know, the Everglades weren't meant for Brent to go running in. So that's why it, they do have an important role. I don't know if you guys saw this back in uh, last summer, but um, this was going on. You're probably all fed up with the pandemic at that point. But um, the government down here has agreed to release 750 million genetically engineered mosquitoes, all males, which don't bite. And then when they meet with a mate with women, the offspring will not be able to produce. Um, I'm not a huge sci-fi movie fan, but I'm 100% convinced within like 10 years, these genetically modified mosquitoes are going to take over the state. So I don't think that anyone's thinking this is a great idea. Like it's going forward, but there's no way this doesn't end up. You're going to be like 10 years from now when the mosquitoes are taken up, you're like, I remember Brent was talking about those genetically engineered mosquitoes. This seems to never end up well, but that's what's going on down here in the Keys. So Florida, another lot of every joke. I'm telling you a couple years from now. Um, there are a lot of other things that bite you, specifically the yellow flies, deer flies, and horse flies. And if you've ever had these no CMs or the midges, these are the worst, man. They are so bad. And the one thing to key is make sure, I can't give you the exact numbers, make sure if you're buying a tent or netting that it's small enough for the no CMs because there are plenty of stories out there on some of the message boards I use for my ultra running where people got their tent and got out in the middle of nowhere and it was the holes were too big in the mesh for the no CMs to just come and torture you all night. So watch it. Okay, briefly, I'm going to talk about the flora that can bother you. This is my old friend, Poison Ivy, which I grew up with in New York, catting at country clubs and like diving into bushes for tips, finding old people's golf balls and getting hit with it. The classic, it's either green or red, three leaves. In New York, it's mostly small shrubs, but in the Everglades, it does grow up to 100 feet high. Um, leaves of three, let them be. If you see anything with three leaves in the Everglades, leave away. Um, Arosiol is the, the ingredient. Um, that can cause a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. The house I have down here is three mango trees in the backyard. I had no idea they were in the same family. And the first time I plucked all the mango trees and got the sap all over me, I got covered in a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. Same family for mangoes. If you're ever picking mangoes, don't let the sap on you. Um, things will peak in about four to 96 hours. So if you see stuff, these bulli here do not have anything that can like transmit it. People will often pop these and then the juice spreads. And then they think it's usually that this is like where they were hit with the bush and then around it later was going to show up anyway, but this is kind of a sterile fluid in it. Um, if you do get hit with poison ivy, wash immediately one direction. If you wash within 10 minutes, you can get up to 50% of the, um, or shy or, 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 or off you. Um, within 30 minutes, it's only about 10% you'll get off. And after an hour, you won't get any of it off. So mostly symptomatic care. Similarly is the poison wood, kind of looks like an inconspicuous shrub. The big thing with this, it's in the same family, but a much more toxic dose of the erosiol. Ur um, so if you see these trees that have the black sap on the bushes, on the leaves or this, stay away and do not go under them in a rainstorm. This is like the, the toxin really just causing itself damage on the tree. It'll drip off the trees during rain. So if you see this, stay away from these trees. Last but not least from the flora perspective are these guys. These are called death apples. They look like little apples. Do not go anywhere near any tree that has anything like apples. Um, Christopher Columbus, when he was in the Caribbean, found these and called them death apples. They're mostly on the coasts. Uh, so if you're going to be kayaking when you're going there, trees can grow 50 feet high. And the white sap has something called floorball with other toxins in it. And it's not just the apples, it's from the leaves and everything. Um, and so if you're burning this for a kindling or you get single drops from rain it can cause a significant, significant reaction. It causes a huge bolus dermatitis. Um, and it's infamous for causing this like temporary blindness when you get it in your eyes. So if you're under a tree in a rainstorm, you're sweating, um, it can cause a lot of damage. It also can cause toxins if you eat it. Although uh, Columbus discussed a lot of death from eating it in his crew, there've been no modern death reported, but they're having cases of gastroenteritis, internal bleeding, shock, or airway. So if you're hungry out in the woods, you see something that looks like an apple, stay away. Okay, so for the last 10 minutes or so, I'm going to just be discussing all the things that people think of with the Everglades and what to be on the lookout for. I'm gonna preface this by saying, very few people get bit, attacked, stung, or anything in the Everglades. But you should know what to do, as the, that race director told us. Know what to do in case you're in. Um, I'm going to kind of go through this quickly. I know you've had other envenomation lectures. Um, 
The vast majority, there are 23 snakes in the Everglades, four of which carry venom, three of which are crotalids, which are pit vipers, named so because they have the pit in there. The classic, or these are the ones that have the long hollow fangs that can bite you real quick and retract, the classic rattlesnakes for your most part. Um, about 25% of, of bites will be dry, but don't take your chance. If you're bit, seek care. Uh, these have hemorrhagic effects. You'll start bleeding, you'll start having edema and swelling, and you can have anaphylactic type symptoms. So if you get bit by a rattlesnake in the Everglades, go and seek care. Uh, splint the extremity in extension and elevation, no pressure mobilization, no tourniquets, ice or suction devices. When I was taking my PEDS board, I had two pediatric boards, not even PEDS emergency, I had two snake bite questions. So something people love talking about on boards. I've seen three in my career snake bites from crotalids, and I had two questions on my pediatric boards from it. So something people like talking about, but no pressure mobilization, no tourniquets, ice or suction, splint it in extension, seek care get crofab. I'm not going to go into the details of this. That's for another day. Um, but there are three crotalids. I've only personally seen one Eastern Dimeback in the Everglades. I have not seen any other rattlesnakes. I've heard them. I've only seen one on a trail. So they're not too common to run to. When I was on upstate New York, the timber rattlesnakes are everywhere. You see those all the time. I've only seen one and it was an Eastern Diamondback, anywhere from three to six feet long. What they're infamous uh, is that they're the ones that curl up with the rattles sticking upward to make a very loud rattle. If you leave them alone, they're pretty cool. They just kind of want to let you know they're there and they will not bite you. But if you do go close to them or you try to get a close picture, they will be aggressive towards you and they can kill you. So you want to stay away. This little dude, I've only seen one of, and it wasn't in the Everglades. Uh, my neighbor was having his uh, yard resodded and they probably got sod from the homestead, which is the area right near the Everglades. And all of a sudden I saw one of these guys in my, in my backyard. So I kept my kids inside for a couple of days and never saw them again. Uh, the thing that makes this guy, he's called the dusky pygmy rattlesnake. This is what he looks like, a red stripe on the back. What I want you to take away is this is what he looks like on a rock. He's very, very tiny. They're, they go to one to two feet, very, very tiny. And they have a tiny rattle that almost sounds like insect buzzing. Uh, it was a unique sound when you had it. So you, I guess it sounds like a rattle, but it's not your typical rattle you think of with rattlesnakes. These guys, on the other hand, I have a uh, guide with a lot of different reptiles and stuff I bring with me when I go off the runs looking for it. And they describe them as pugnacious, which is a great word, easy to quarrel. Since I read that a couple years ago, I use the word pugnacious all the time, but especially when talking about the dusky pygmy rattlesnakes, it's a great word. Um, it'll be painful or venomous if you get bit. It's not a big deal. You're not going to die from it if it's any of us, but if you have a young child or a pet, um, it can be fatal. So more of an annoyance and seek care if you get bit, but it's probably not going to kill you. Last is the cotton mouth or the water moccasin. Um, these are the guys that I, I'm the most concerned of because a lot of times when I go, I'm in knee deep water. So it's always on the lookout for it as I go through. Um, what I want you to see in this picture is the way this the snake is holding his mouth up and exposing the white. It doesn't really make a difference. You're on the trail and you see a rattlesnake, just stay away. But that's how you kind of can tell, one of the ways you can tell the Florida man. This is an, old, um, an older one because he's mostly brown. Uh, they can also go up to six feet, usually they're in the three to four feet range with a brown body. This is what they look like typically. And as they get older, more that dark brown, they open that white mouth with their fangs and show it up with the head up. And they can also cause a life-threatening bite. Um, this is the other guy everyone loves talking about in wilderness medicine. He's all throughout the Everglades, but mostly not in the water. He's more under in the pine rocklands and like the brush underground. This is the coral snake. Um, he's from, not from the crotalids, he's an elapidid, and these guys are very secretive. They stay in the hardwood forest. This is when you're running through the, the brush, you want to make sure you're not stepping on them. They'll really try to bo not bother you at all, and they are neurotoxins. Instead of making you bleed out, they're going to have neurologic effects. Uh, the infamous saying I just have to bring up is the uh, red on yellow kills a fellow, the red on black venom like. This is the king snake, also in the Everglades. If you run into either of these guys, don't start doing uh, the sayings in your mind and trying to remember if you can pick this up, just stay away if you see either of them, although only one of them is toxic. And these guys have much smaller teeth. They're not like that quick strike and uh, recoil, as you would expect with the, um, the crotalids. Um, they have to really suck in and bite into you. But again, if you get bit, start heading out. It takes up to 12 hours till the neurotoxin comes in. You want to escape as best you can. Um, and that's where you start seeing this can lead to muscle weakness, fasciculations, and respiratory arrest. So you want to get out of there. Um, with the coral snake, if it's going to be a couple hours till you get out, this is a time you may want to consider a pressure bandage before you get the systemic because you don't want it to end up where you're not breathing out there. Um, there is a limited supply of anti-venom, but not readily available. 
I have to mention this kind of jerk. This is the Burmese Python. It's not really his fault, but brought in here after Hurricane Andrew and taking over the Everglades. So minimal threat to humans if you're out there, as long as you don't try to handle it or hunt it. But if you have pets with you, it might come attacking. Uh, but these guys are everywhere and kind of eating everything in sight. So I just had to make a quick reference to them. Uh, the main predator from the mammalian side of things is the Florida panther. Um, he's kind of all throughout this area where I've been hanging out. I have never personally seen one, although I do do a race in um, the Everglades it's called Everglades Ultra every year where they have had sightings on the course in the middle of the race with it, but most actively at nighttime, dusk to dawn. So if you're going out, um, especially if you live in Naples or one of these areas over here, you might see them in your backyard. So hike with a friend, secure your small pets and kids, unlikely to get attacked. They really don't want to bother you, and there have been no reported attacks in Florida. Everything I'm about to tell you is based on other parts, Texas or other areas where they have attacks. But if you're going to be that first case report of someone getting attacked, what you want to do is give them an escape route. Do not make eye contact. Do not bend over. Do not run away. Just appear large. Speak with a firm voice. And if anything else, just fight, fight, fight. Um, really punch, kick, anything you can. Protect your own head or neck. Panthers are infamous and mountain lions or pumas, however you want to call it, for going for the head and neck and going straight for the kill, as opposed to bears, which kind of want to bat you around. What I have seen a ton of are bobcats. They also don't want to bother you. No one's ever come near me. These guys live in the saw palmetto, the dense shrub th uh, thickets. They're about three feet big. They look like a big house cat. They really don't want to bother you. I wrote this the rest of the people. And then there was like the video this week. I don't know if you saw of like a uh, bobcat attacked a woman and the husband punched it. Um, and it was all over the news. It was kind of crazy. I'm like, wow, they don't attack. And it turned out that one had rabies. So if they're attacking you and you get bit, they're probably not going to kill you themselves, but they probably have rabies. So you want to go get your rabies shots. And uh, they're just much smaller than a panther. But again, see anything that looks like a house cat that's a giant house cat in the Everglades, stay away. Uh, most people don't know, but Florida has a fairly significant black bear population of 4,000, a lot of them in Southern um, Florida. They're smaller than your typical black bears you'd see up north. Um, very shy, great climbers and runners, but deer campsites, if they've been fed, they're not gonna be so scary. Um, they're infamous for standing and being aggressive and pawing the ground, huffing, clacking, snorting. That's them just trying to scare you, stare your ground. Almost every time there's been an attack, people have said they were eerily silent right before. So if they're doing a lot of tactics here, do not turn your back, do not run away. If you're from a distance, no sudden movements, kind of make some noise to try to scare them away. Don't play dumb, make some noise. Again, avoid the eye contact, they take it as a threat. If you're up close and personal, really back away slowly by using a calm but assertive voice. And if all else fails, fight. Again, no predatory attacks. No one's ever just come after you, but if they sense you as being a threat, they will attack in Florida in defensive behavior. I was unable to see any deaths from this. These guys are all over the place, feral hogs. I bet you did not get, uh, expect to have a second reference to a explorer in your lecture today, but Hernando de Soto brought these over back in the 1500s. These things are humongous, six feet, 150 pounds, can run fast. They carry viruses, pseudo rabies, swine brucelliosis, and um, when you go around the world, 88% of the attacks, uh, attacks that happen are in the Northern Hemisphere and 50% are fatal. So this is most common during the rutting or mating season, which happens to be the area where we most like to hang out there because it's the dry season. What do you do if a feral attack comes? They come when they're threatened or defending themselves against hunter, that's a big area, or they have to protect their piglets. Again, try to stay the higher ground and keep your footing. They try to swing you with their tusks and if they get you on the ground, that's really where they're gonna inflict their injuries. So try to keep your ground, fight back the best you can. In general, stay out of the water. Um, when you're paddling, oysters are everywhere. They have razor sharp shells, um, which can cut you and get you infection. And if you try to eat these thinking you're getting like a free raw bar uh, supply, they are filled with Vibrio species down here. So do not be eating your raw oysters. Do not cut your feet on them, wear water shoes. In general, if you're into more than a couple inches of water up to your, your knees, a couple feet of water, they have pretty much everything in the open water. So don't go for typical swims, sharks, uh, stingrays, uh, man of war, jellyfish, lionfish. Uh, a lot of the fish also have high, high levels, some of the highest in the country of mercury toxicity, specifically in the freshwater fish. So if you plan on going on this bachelor party that I've been talking about, and you're going to start catching fish for a week and just living off the fat of the land, just be aware. If you're a woman or a child, you should not be eating bass, the catfish. And even if you're um, uh, an, any other individual, no more than once a month, just very high in mercury. So Coming to the end here, what all you guys really want to know about, I know, is the difference between alligators and crocodiles. Uh, the Florida Everglades and the South Florida are the only place in the world where both of these kinds live together. Um, the alligators tend to live in the fresh water. They have a nice round snout. They're black. They don't have their teeth exposed when they come. Crocodiles are a lot creepier. They're just rounded with huge teeth, um, and they tend to live in the salt water. See in the background this nuclear power plant? Just think of that for one second. 
Alligators, most active dust to dawn. Stay away, even if they look lethargic, they can quickly lunge at you, swing their tail, snap their jaw. Um, and again, around campsites and canals where they're most worrisome, where people have fed them. So don't be dumping your food while kayaking. They're going to start following you around, thinking you're a friend. Uh, this is my dad. My dad, gradually, as he came down here for the first time, got closer and closer until he got about four feet away. I kept telling him, don't do it. Luckily, he was not snapped at or shot at or snouted at or anything like that. If you're going to get bitten by or attacked by an alligator, um, it's going to happen in Florida. 24 deaths recorded in like the past 30 years, 22 of them in Florida. Most of the attacks, most of the news complaints, they're all over the place here. Um, as opposed to the crocodile, there are about 2,000 of them. They live in the salt water, rarely inland. And as opposed to the African crocodile, much more shy, much more um, trying to avoid you at all cases. Uh, most of the time, you'll see them noisily splash. I, when I run in this one area of a mangrove preserve down in South Florida, you'll see them jump in the water all the time, uh, frightened. If you see them staring at you with their mouth open, it's really creepy, but that's just them like almost like a dog with their tongue out. And as I said, only one attack on humans in Florida, so not likely to be attacked. Um, it's really interesting because they're really growing. There's this nuclear power plant here, and these are cooling uh, channels they made where they put the reactor underneath to kind of cool it down. And the alligator, uh, the crocodiles are thriving down here and really growing because of the warm water. So it's kind of nice. Um, and like I said, what happens if you are one of those six people a year bitten? Um, do your best to keep a distance. They like to protect themselves, and only if they're nested, they feel threatened, they'll come after you. Hissing means you should leave. Um, most bites are by men and near the shore, and that's similar to snakes. That's because people are more close, men are more close to go mess with them. Um, and if you're going to the deeper water, they're going to have the advantage. They're going to try to bite you and roll with you. Um, if you see one coming after you, they go fast, but they tire very quickly within about 15 to 20 minutes due to their anaerobic metabolism. So do not zigzag as classically thought. Once they bite you, they hold on. About one in three will try to get a better grip, that is when you want to escape. If they are clamped down, do not try to pull your arm out or kind of pry yourself free. There is no hope to get that open. You just fight, punch it, punch in the eye, stick your arm down his throat, punch it on the snout, do anything you can to let it go. And once it goes, it goes. If they latch you and bring you in the water, they're going to roll with it. Just fight, fight, fight as it rolls with you. Try to get it out. And this is what they're saying. Do not try to open up the mouth. It will not work. Poke it in the eye, punch it on the snout, run in a straight line, and you should be okay. Um, I would be remiss if I do not just briefly mention the kids as a pediatrician here. Uh, I think there's a lot to know, and there's a lot of things you can learn from coming on the Everglades for the day. Um, how to pack a light day pack, how to pr practice using a whistle and knowing how to use it, how to use high energy snacks, planning on uh, hydration. Um, you want to have them wear bright colors. You don't want to lose them, especially if they're going to be wandering off on you. Um, kind of teaching them how to dress for a camping in, um, endeavor. Uh, make sure they know how to use the first aid kit and what you want to make sure you have children for specific doses in there. Practice being quiet and losing no trace and playing games out there. So. Anyway, I know I talk fast. I know I talk a lot. and I've kept 53 minutes of your time. In summary, be prepared for the weather, truck conditions, what you may encounter, both environmental and wildlife. Um, you know, like I said, many times people are always fearing of the wildlife, but you're much more likely to be hit by the environment and uh, bring a friend and have some fun. So. Uh, some of my references I have here, which I can share with you if you want. Any questions? Well, thank you, Dr. Rogers. I think I think I speak for everyone when I say that was a great talk. Uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free unmute or uh, send them in the chat. I'm happy to pass them along. Uh, the one I have, one one listener uh, wrote in, and as they saw a lighter in your first aid kit, they asked what you were using it for. Yeah, that's a, a thing that I always have this fear that I'm going to be trapped at night. I bring a lighter everywhere I go, and I have a knife in it, but it's something that I always just fear. I'm going to have a sprained ankle and need to start. You shouldn't be starting fires. In the it's just something I always carry with me. I don't smoke. I don't use drugs. I don't do anything. I just always have one with me, and I always fear. If I'm, most of the time when I'm out doing a long run, it's the December, January, February, and get cold tonight. So I always have one. Um, I used to bring a flint and I just have trouble lighting it. So I don't use it, but it's something that I always carry as a safety. That's like my always thing. If anything else happens, I'll be able to make a fire. So that's kind of like, maybe it's just uh, the craziest. Um, okay, so the youngest age you would take a kiddo into the Everglades. When you're going to the Everglades, there are a number of, um, there are a number of, visitor centers that have areas close to them. Those can go any age. I take my kids in all the time. My seven-year-old, I've just started camping at like the, um, the main campsites near the visitor centers this year. 
I would say when you can feel comfortable that you're not going to get lost, like taking him through the water, I would not take him for years. You know, when I go on my hikes through the Cypress Swamp, that um, those areas where you're up to your knees, I just don't feel safe with an alligator taking him under or um, one of uh, like uh, an alligator getting him. With regards to like, uh, I, I, I've never seen a panther or black bear out there on my own. So I would not be saying, um, I would not be taking them to certain parts, but there are a lot of areas we can do. There's an area right by uh, the main Ernest Co, which is in Homestead, Florida, where it's about a 10 mile hike. And that's gonna be my goal. And it goes out to a camping center. It's on like an old tram road. And those are the uh, type of ways I would start taking them out there. So as long as you know where you're gonna have a straight out, you're near a ranger station, you're not gonna be trouncing through water. You can start, there are great parts of the park where you can go in very early, um, even in Homestead, uh, I mean, uh, Flamingo, which is down south, as long as you go in the winter, the mosquitoes are tough, even in the winter time. So you just have to make sure I may go for a day trip, see how it goes to see if you could get it. My son, I think by next year, he'll be ready to actually go in a back country, but he's been able to manage in the front country, kind of like the more uh, standardized camping sites. Um, so safe distance in terms of the lightning strike, that's a great number in terms of, I will say, um, I don't have the exact number of what's recommended. I have seen myself people be struck from like struck by lightning or right next to lightning where they've been affected and people 15, 20 feet away are not. I would keep a safe distance of 50 feet. If you see, if you guys are in a campsite and you're spreading out, I would do at least 50 feet. I can't, I, you know, I should look up the exact number of what is the number and I'll try to get back and post it on the, the website. What is the safe area that the lightning side splash can travel? In the water, it can go much further. That's why you want to get off the water if you can. Okay. Um, so in terms of the tourniquet for the, let me see, is that, um, um, in terms of the tourniquet, what's been shown with the crotalids is you don't want to use any suction devices or anything. Um, what's kind of counterintuitive when you're speaking from an ER perspective, when you're speaking versus in the field type of perspective. Um, it used to say with the crotalids, which is what, like I said, that causes a hemorrhagic effect. So you get a lot of swelling. So if you get bit most commonly on your hand or your foot, the most common place you get it, it swells up. So in the field, you want to take off any constricting jewelry. If you have rings distally or bracelets, watches, things like that before it swells. And then in the field, it's been shown to splints in extension below the level of the heart, kind of keep it from getting, um, extended and, uh, or keep it above the level. You want to let the, sorry, when you're in the field, you want to keep your extremity extended up to kind of bring the swelling down so you don't lose flow distal. Uh, once you're in the hospital and you have crofab running, then you keep it low to keep it away from having systemic absorption. With the coral snake, which is the only non crotalid you may experience here, um, there is debate as to, because the main side effects are Neuro, uh, neurologic, so respiratory depression and inability to breathe. There are some, some literature saying if you can do a mild pressure bandage, it may help. I know someone here said tourniquets for invention are outdated and removed. Um, the downside is if you put it on as a tourniquet, it, it's often been shown to increase absorption. So you would not want to put a tourniquet on. It's only been shown to increase absorption. But something they say a mild pressure bandage might help but it would only be for the coral snake. And if you're in that case, you're in, like I said, pretty bad shape. So hopefully you can get there within the 12 hours it takes typically to go. What, in your opinion, are the most important tools and medical equipment to take in a swamp compared to other remote environments? Um, okay, in terms of tools, it depends again, what you're gonna be doing on um, and what your plan is. The most, the two big areas where I would say you're going to be out there for days on end would be if you're doing this like 99 mile wilderness waterway, or if you're doing a hike, like a through hike on the Florida trail and the first maybe hundred miles or so are in swampy area. I just don't know further up. They have uh, the Ocala national forest, other areas that are slightly different. Okay. Um, to me, keeping dry clothes that you can get to easily, um, bug spray, sunscreen, the basic type of stuff. Um, and just like a walking stick really more than anything. And just being more mentally prepared to be going through the water. Like I said, that video where you show, you have to understand your feet are gonna be wet for a long period of time. That used to be one of my biggest pet peeves. It's something I've totally embraced now as I go through. Um, so in terms of like otherwise tools, I, I don't really if there's much else from where you're going on other trails, but just be prepared for being wet all the time and bringing dry clothes and keeping everything good, so. If you have any other questions, I feel free. I know people are starting to get out and leave, but um, 
Um, hopefully you guys learned something. Hopefully if you're in, if you're ever in Florida, shoot me an email. I'm down to take you out. I just want anyone to come out with me. So it's a lot harder than you think. I'm on like ultra running boards to try to get people like message boards on Facebook and stuff to try to find people whenever someone's down in the area. I do races out there. I did one a week and a half ago in West Palm Beach, a 50 K that I was going through water. So, um, let me know. Dr. Rogers, thanks so much for the talk. Um, I'm assuming that's somewhere up North in your background. So as someone who, uh, was just recently hiking in the Adirondacks. I'm curious as to like what, what the, like what your favorite aspects of like being down in Florida and like that terrain is compared to, uh, compared to being further up north and just like, I don't know, any surprises that like, that you didn't expect to like um, so let me, let me preface this. Like, it's not like, oh, Brent wants to move to Florida. I was like kind of dragged down here by my wife when she's from down here. She went to University of Miami for medical school. Um, she's the one who brought me down here. So it's the humidity when I came down here and it's still seven years in kills me. What I will say, I, when I go up in the Adirondacks, I love the trails. I love the mountains. I love the views down here. The thing that really gets me is more the, um, the environment in terms of like the flora and really seeing like one thing I didn't show you because it's not really medicine related, but looking for orchids, looking at the animals, looking at the birds, looking at that, the aspect of that makes it worthwhile for me to be trudging out. And it's really in quite of like, you know, I've been up in the Adirondacks where I go on a trail. I sign my guest book and three days later, I come back and I'm the last person to have signed the guest book when I go back into the trails. So here it's really so so few people are out there when you're kayaking or hiking you won't see anyone for a long time which is kind of scary but i love the it's the, the complete serenity of things um and more like just what you see down here because it's you don't realize it does like people think of it as a swamp but it's really a unique ecosystem you see different plants and the animals and just such a diversity which i never really took that appreciation when i was running trails in the mountains in the northeast it's more to like be out in the woods I never had the appreciation for it down here, but let me tell you the humidity, things like that. You just, it's, it's something. And like, again, the solitude can be challenging and running through water can be challenging. It's, you saw that video, it's not running. It's really trudging through it. So. Awesome. Thank you. I uh, probably went to the wrong place in the Adirondacks. I was actually really surprised last fall with how many people we saw up there. It might've just been the pandemic, but yeah, um, yeah no, it's definitely. Be okay. Cool. Yeah. Like I said, I've, I like to find, I like to be, when I'm out, I've lived in Miami where there are really not too many trails. There are like three mountain bike courses you can find in parks here that if, and I, I luckily work at ER schedule. So I can go on a Tuesday morning when people aren't mountain biking, but especially on the weekends, you can't find solitude in the city. It's in, no one knows how to drive down here. So they're always trying to hit me with their cars and stuff like that. So I like to kind of go where I can really be alone and just like get, be away with my thoughts and just really be in isolation. And like I said, it's really beautiful. And since I've started this, I now like I should I, I should have put some pictures like I grow orchids I grow plumeria I grow different bromeliads I have fruit trees of all sorts like I've really taken a liking to like that aspect of stuff that never attracted and like I'm really into like that aspect it's like uh, not the typical like masculine behavior as I'm coming up I'm like more into the gardening and flowers and planting different types of trees and things like that so it's really all from exploring this area that I've really gotten a sense of that. Well, Dr. Rogers, thank you for your time. Thank you again for such a oh, great talk. Thank you guys so, so much for having me. It was awesome what you guys do. Everyone, we'll see you again next week for our next one. All right. Thank you, guys.